Welcome to The Speechy Show. Being a speech language pathologist often means having too much work and not enough planning time. To beat the overwhelm, we're bringing you the tricks and tools that will make your job a little bit easier. Welcome to The Speechy Show. I am your host, Carrie Clark from speechandlanguagekids.com. And I am here today with Ayelet. Ayelet, there we go. Did I get it? <laughs> Ayelet is from strengthinwords.com. And we are here today to talk to you about parent training with early intervention and how you can help get families on board with that therapy, which is so critical for that age because yes. that's where you're going to make the progress. That's it. So welcome to the show. We're glad to have you today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. If you guys are new to the show, this is The Speechy Show. We do this once a week, and this is our chance to hop on and share some tips with you on a specific topic. We have a new speech language pathologist come on with me every week, and we do this on Monday afternoons on Facebook Live. So welcome if you're here on Facebook Live with us right now. If you're just joining us, we're talking about parent training for early intervention. So if you are on here with us live right now, go ahead and type in what ages you're working with so we can make sure we are getting the right information to you today. Um, and while they're doing that, will you go ahead and give us a little bit of information about you and your background? Sure. So I am uh, currently in private practice and I work primarily with infants and toddlers and preschool aged kiddos. And I have worked in the past in um, in the schools, contracting with the schools, doing lots of AAC, um, and doing lots of early intervention with nonprofits, clinic-based, home-based, um, and I love that those early communicators. It's it's so fun. Um, yeah, and then I I also run strengthinwords.com, which is a podcast and a blog and a whole number of online-based resources, including. Um, courses and curriculums for parents, caregivers, and speech and language pathologists and other professionals who work with uh, infants and toddlers. Excellent, excellent. So I will, when we put this recording up on the website over at speechandlanguagekids.com, we will have links to all of the resources mentioned today and the strength, strengthinwords.com website that you are running. So we'll have all that for you and we'll try to put those in the comment section of this Facebook Live as well so you have them. All right, Jenny says she's working with age three. If you are on Facebook Live, go ahead and type in what ages you are working with right now so we know what kind of what kind of spread we have here today on Facebook Live with us. Okay, while you're doing that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our five points. So we have five tips to share to, with you today that are gonna help you on your journey of having parents help with this therapy process and create that real meaningful change that we need to see in our early intervention students. So our first tip today is to use useful, distilled, bite-sized pieces of knowledge for our families. Ayelet, tell us how that looks in practice. Sure, so just, just to say, you know, parents and caregivers of any infant or toddler, whether, you know, they are having any kind of developmental delay or not, we're all feeling vulnerable, undervalued, and we often lack confidence, right? We live in this super crazy digital world where we have access to all kinds of information and it's way too overwhelming. So again, parents want that distilled bite-sized nugget that they can just digest. So they want to learn about the ways that they can interact with and teach their little ones. So we actually have to teach them about basic terminology and basic child development information. So, you know, what, what joint attention? What is scaffolding? What is object permanence? And then how do they relate to how their child learns in a meaningful way? So I think we often go straight to that work or play, like the therapy, without taking the time to help parents to understand what on earth we're doing and why, which is, of course, why it looks like we're just playing with our children. But when we, give, when we take the time to really look at and give those terms, and show them examples of what we're doing, then we're, we're doing a great, great service to do our therapy. Yes, absolutely. So you're working with these parents, you're sitting down, instead of just sitting down and starting to do your joint attention activity, talk about what joint attention is and give them some information about what that means and why it's important to work on it. 
I feel like a lot of times parents just see, you know, like you said, see us playing and they think, well, that's no different than what I do. And so they don't, they kind of tune out and don't see it as something meaningful that they should try to do. But if you can explain kind of what's going on behind the scenes and what you're really targeting, that can really help parents get on board with the process. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. So that's our first tip. The next one then is going to be to earn trust. And that is so huge with this. A lot of times you're coming into these families' homes, you're telling them that they're doing it all wrong. I know that's not the way we are trying to approach it, but that's how it can feel for a parent. Yeah. So how do we build trust with these families that we're working with? So simply having that credential and walking into a home or a clinic is just not enough exactly. So we have to earn that trust by, um, number one, recognizing and labeling their fears and concerns. So spell out what you're doing and let them try it. I think we tend to go straight to building a repertoire with the child, which is huge, but we also can't forget to build a repertoire with the caregiver. So when you uh, are doing an activity, give them a turn and then talk about it, talk about how it felt what they noticed, what felt good, what didn't feel good, and then brainstorm with them how they can then generalize from that play interaction into the rest of their day. And then another piece is always find a resource that they can say read through or learn from, whether it's a journal article or a therapy blogger post that you found, a photocopy of a page in a textbook or a handout that you've made or a podcast episode. Position yourself as not only a source of knowledge in your session, but also as a great resource. Um, So also, you know, when you attend a conference or a webinar, save the handouts or resources that they share. One of the the things that I like to do is to have sort of a running document on my phone or your notebook or whatever you use, um, where you write down your favorite sort of phrases or tips or resources. And I love um, Evernote for this because it syncs from my phone to my computer and then I can organize my thoughts later on. That's wonderful, yeah. So we're having a little bit of sound quality issues. So if you guys miss any of that, what she's saying is to build that trust, you want to address their concerns and their fears, make sure that they feel validated, and then make sure that you're giving and sharing information that's going to help them through this process and establish yourself as a resource. So I really like the idea of sharing with them blog posts or information in writing. Even if you are explaining the same thing face to face, I know as a parent, if I walk into learning something new about my child, they can tell it to me face to face. And I'm like, yeah, that makes total sense. And they're like, do you understand? And I say, yes, I totally do. And then I get home and I'm like, what was I supposed to do? (laughs) I do this with my son's own therapy. He has uh, therapy for sensory processing. And so, and I'm, you know, I'm even in the niche or the field and I, and I still will get home and say, okay, I understood it when he said it, but now I'm not sure what part of this I'm supposed to be doing, or, you know, I missed a piece. So if you can send them with something that they can read and review and go back over, you're going to get way better compliance with whatever you're trying to get. Yeah. It's going to feel less like you're telling them what to do and more like you're, you're giving them the food that they need, right? The resources that they need. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. If you guys are um, having any questions or if you're, you're missing pieces because of the audio cutting out, please go ahead and type in your questions and comments and we will address those as we go along. And if you're on Facebook Live with us right now, please hang on. We're going to be doing some giveaways here in just a minute. You don't want to miss those. All right. So the third tip that we have for you today is to show by doing. This is super critical for this age, especially when you're working with parents who may not be familiar with speech therapy and these processes. So talk about how show by doing looks for you. So if you are going to tell a mom or a grandma or a dad to be silly with her, their child, that's something that you're going to need to not only model each time you see them, but also pull the grown up in to take their own turn to be creative and to be silly. Um, you're going to need to stimulate the grown up's ability to play. So. As grown-ups, as adults, we tend to think of play as actually a linear process. Like we do, like we look at most things. So blocks are for building, books are for reading, A plus B equals C. (laughs) Um, 
And it's, our, it's our job to model and show that books are also for mouthing, for making animal and other environmental sounds from the pictures, for the clothes procedure, for singing, and blocks are for knocking down, for hiding things under, for sorting, etc. Um, we have to show them, reteach grown-ups how to play, because we, we forget. I think so many people that I've talked to, even speech therapists who – for instance, work with older children or with grown-ups, they're like, oh, I feel great when it comes to you know, working with someone who's had a stroke, but if you want me to work or play with my child who's two, <laughs> I have no idea what to do. So it's not, it's, everybody needs to relearn how to play. It's basic stuff, but it's hard. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes if you just, if you make a fool of yourself first, then they yeah. feel more comfortable making a fool of themselves. Which is, you know, kind of what it feels like when you're asking a, a grown-up to get down on the floor and play, you know? If you get down and you're doing all kinds of silly things and, like, clearly making a fool of yourself, that parent is going to feel so much more comfortable trying to do some of those play things than if yeah. you're like, okay, now I want you to do this. Do, go do that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, hold them in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> absolutely. All right, we have a question here. Let's see. I would like to get advice on helping a toddler who was a shaken baby at three months. His express, expressive language progress is really, really inconsistent. Yeah, that can be so hard. I would say if you're, um, if you're working with somebody who has really inconsistent expressive language, I imagine that child is probably functioning at a much younger level, then play therapy is going to be the way to do it. Just like we're talking about getting down and, and teaching those parents how to play and work the therapy in through play. Yeah, I also think um, it's funny. I think when we talk about when we use the words and terminology to describe the child, it's going to give us information about what we need to do for the parent. So the child's expressive language is inconsistent. So what you want to make sure to work on is to build consistency with the parent. So show the parent that the more consistent they are, the more um, ways in everyday you know, caregiving routines that they can build in these strategies, these tools, you know, these things that you're showing them what to do, the more consistent their child is. And that what they do translates into their child's skills. Yeah. One thing that jumps out to me just to, I mean, we don't know this child, obviously, but one thing that I usually recommend is having the parents talk at a level that's right at or right above their child's level. So if this child is inconsistently using one and two word utterances, then the parents can consistently use one to two word utterances and provide those good models that are going to help him understand how he can communicate with the world around him. Yeah, great point. All right, we're gonna jump back into our tips, but if you guys have any other questions, go ahead and shoot those at us. So the next tip is keep it simple. Talk to me about how it looks to keep it simple in these therapy sessions. So if you are bringing in fancy equipment and attractive and beautiful, expensive-looking play materials into your therapy, even if they weren't expensive but if they look super fancy or complicated, those families that you work with are going to assume that that is what's necessary to play with their children, and they're going to miss the point. Um, and this is important because so many of us work with a whole gamut of socioeconomic status um, brackets of families. So what we want is to make sure that everyone has access to play, everyone has access to therapy, and to show them that it doesn't mean that they need um, to be shopping all the time for new toys and to be getting these fancy looking things. And so whenever possible, show them how to create play materials out of objects that already exist in their home, whether you're bringing your own version of it or whether you're grabbing stuff from their house, from, you know, the kitchen or the bathroom or the bedroom, whatever it is, um, whether those things are repurposed or homemade or just simply, you know, something that's hanging out on the floor. Absolutely. I can tell you from my own children that they love novelty. If something is new, they are going to behave much better for you than they will ever behave for me with our boring old toys that they've already played with. <laughs> Exactly. So if you can come into my house and show me how to do something with the boring materials I already have, then I'm going to get some buy-in. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> Wonderful. I love it. Okay. The last tip we have for you today is to repeat and vary. How does this look? 
So uh, this really relates to the last point about how if you have things in your house that, you know, maybe a child has played with even before, or I've had a lot of parents tell me like, gosh, I, I need to go to the store because he's bored with all of my of, all of his toys. He never plays with them. Um, okay, well, show them a new way to play with the same materials and same toys that they have. They, again, they're probably... A lot of parents tend to do the same thing with a play material because that's what they think it's for, right? A book <laughs> is for reading. But show them a whole different way that they may have never thought about it. So, of course, re repetition with variation is a concept you have got to drill on home because we know that children learn through repetition, through interaction, and through practice but so do their parents, right? So in their in your therapy, you're going to want to do this as well. Model lots of different activities you can do with the same materials. Mm -hmm. So whether that's integrating, you know, music into it, into you know, a book of um, songs, or uh, whether that's integrating, you know, some new social routine or finger play or whatever it is, like try something new with it. Absolutely. One of the things I love to do is use the same tune to like a common song, like you can do like the ABC tune or whatever you want, and then just switch the words for whatever activity we're doing. Because, yep. I, I, you know, with my own kids and the children that I work with, I've noticed that if you can add a tune to it or a song to it, it, it seems to go a little better, especially yep. transitions. And so you can just use the same tune. You don't have to be coming up with new songs all the time. Same way like you're talking about. You don't have to have a new toy all the time. You can use the same toy for multiple different um, different activities. Or use something that's not even a toy. Use some measuring cups and spoons and do something with those. Yep. So, yeah. Wonderful. Awesome. Okay, so we have, let's see, Carrie says, I agree, using their toys and materials is so important. Absolutely. Okay, so those are our five tips. We're going to share some resources for you now, and then we're going to do a giveaway. So stay tuned if you're with us on Facebook Live and type in those questions if you have them. But let's talk about your favorite resources for working with parents in this, this age group. What do you have for us? So first of all, um, the Strength in Words podcast is actually a great resource for us SLPs for DIY material ideas, for ways to explain and break down concepts, for ideas to use music as a framework for learning, like you were talking about, Carrie. Um, it's also a great place to point infants, or well, to point their parents. <laughs> the parents <laughs> the infants, infants play. <laughs> Don't listen to this podcast, Jess. <laughs> um, it's a great place to point parents of infants and toddlers for parent-friendly developmental information and for simple ideas. Um, and again, when you share resources that you recommend, you earn trust and you earn buy-in. Uh, I have a few other specific free resources on my site. So, for instance, there's a free ebook about simple DIY activities to support development with a whole host of different things for supporting um, not only communication, but motor and sensory and cognitive development, which, of course, we know that infants and toddlers learn holistically. So, if you have a an activity that is, you know, primarily geared towards motor development, you are very very real um in a very real way it's going to be easy to integrate ways to to support communication development as well um, and then i also have a free email course about building language opportunities into caregiving routines so again supporting ways for generalization um if you're you know showing a parent how to you know do something during a diaper routine because that's what you're there for show them another way that you can do it into a different caregiving routine. So I have a whole free five-day email course um, that can help you show, show you or show parents how to do that. Um, these are ob obviously great resources to share with clients and then great places to find ideas and uh, new ways of explaining things to your clients. I love also the um, free monthly calendars from Speech and Language at Home. They are such awesome printable resources to share with families. She has, she releases a new one each month um, and it's every single day. There's a different, super simple uh, therapy and play activity that you, well, really play activity that you can do with, with ch a child who's either an early communicator. Um, she breaks it down between, you know, pre-verbal first words 
words and then sort of expanding utterances, I think. Those are great, and those are free as well. Um, and then there's a, an amazing newish site called The Informed SLP, which does a beautiful literature review of published research research each month. And then she separates the research by age group and by work setting. And currently they have primarily pediatrics and school age articles, but you can sign up to get notified when they start to release articles specific to early intervention. And this is going to be just a great place to find uh, evidence-based practice articles that support your therapy and a fantastic resource to easily find any information that you relate to parents about early communication development. So a great place to go to find um, info to share with families. And then lastly, I run a Facebook group with Leah Curtin of Speech and Language at Home called Let's Talk Infants and Toddlers and it's a really wonderful, safe space for parents, caregivers, and all kinds of professionals who work with infants and toddlers of all developmental levels. And I encourage you to check it out because there are so many great resources and ideas being shared all the time in there and lots of parents asking questions um, and lots of professionals weighing in. So it's a great place to sort of get a good idea of like, oh, that's another way I could explain that to a parent. Mm-hmm. Perfect. All right, so that was a ton of resources. Um, a lot of those, I think, are over at strengthenwords.com, correct? Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have the monthly calendars, speech and language at home, informed SLP, and that face group, Facebook group, Let's Talk Infants and Toddlers. So uh, would you mind, after this, would you go into the comment section of Facebook and add the links to those things so people can find them? Sure. Perfect, no so check for that there. All right, so now we're gonna do a giveaway. We're gonna actually do two giveaways. If you are new to the show, we do this every week as well. Our guest is gonna give away one thing and I'm gonna give away one thing. So why don't you tell us what your giveaway is first? So I have a, um, an album that's great for families and for therapists. It's, a, it's called Strength in Words, Music for Families. And it's an album that has lots of finger plays and lots of, um, songs and rhythms, just great things to um, show how to sort of vary uh, different kinds of music uh, experiences for kids and show parents and caregivers how to do that. So I have a digital copy of that for you guys today. Perfect. One, one of you. Yes. <laughs> so the first person to answer the question on Facebook Live is going to get that giveaway, the album, and the second person to answer on Facebook Live is going to get my giveaway, which is two free months in the Speech Therapy Solution. That's my premium membership site for SLPs. We have a whole bunch of low prep uh, or no prep materials ready to go for you. We answer questions you have about tough cases. We've got a whole group of SLPs answering questions. And then we just got approved to do CEUs. So we will be offering all of your CEUs starting hopefully, fingers crossed, in September of this year of 2017. So. That's coming down the line. Uh, you'll definitely want to get into the membership before September because the price will go up, but you can lock in your lower rate if you sign up by the end of August. So you can find that over at speechandlanguagekids.com slash join. But one lucky winner today is going to get two free months in that membership from me. All right. Fiona says, will you have a list of, on your website of the websites you just mentioned for resources? Yes, we will have the links on the show notes of this at speechandlanguagekids.com in about a week or two when that goes up. Or you are going to put the links into the, the Facebook comments section. So yeah. we'll, we'll have that um, after we finish here. We'll go in and, and get all that taken care of. Okay, so let's do the giveaway. I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to get my question up. I'm going to ask a question. First two people are going to win. Okay, here's the question. Name something in a child's home that can be repurposed for therapy. So we were talking about how it's important to use the child's materials that are already there, not to bring in all these flashy new exciting toys and then leave the parents with nothing to do. <laughs> so what's something that you have repurposed from a child's home to use for therapy? All right, Rosemary Morgan says blocks, wonderful. And Rosemary is going to win the album of music. And how do you want her to contact you to get that? Um, I think the best way is to um, send me an email, Rosemary, at I yell it at strengthandwords.com. It's A-Y-E-L-E-T. <laughs> Perfect, congratulations, Rosemary. Let's see who is next. 
I got to scroll back down. We're getting a bunch. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Maria Christina Grundvik, maybe? <laughs> she says socks. I'm laughing because the first two answers rhyme. It's blocks and socks. <laughs> I love it. We can make a song out of it. <laughs> oh, we could. <laughs> and yes, socks would be great. <laughs> You're already going. <laughs> All right, congratulations, Maria. You win the two free months in the Speech Therapy Solution. You can email me at carrie at speechandlanguagekids.com, and that is C-A-R-R-I-E, and my assistant, Kenna, will get you all set up with your two free months. We got more blocks, toilet paper rolls, and paint, pots, Legos, bath time toys, clothes. Awesome. We got all kinds of responses. Thank you, everyone. All right, that's our show today. Thank you all for participating and for hanging out. And thank you for joining us and sharing your tips on parent caregivers. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Carrie. Absolutely. And where can people find more about you if they want to find more of your stuff? Strengthandwords.com. Perfect. And you can find me over at speechandlanguagekids.com. And don't forget to check out the Speech Therapy Solution and hop in there if you are interested for next school year because we will be raising the price when those CEUs go into place. So you can head over to speechandlanguagekids.com slash join. And don't forget to join us next week on The Speechy Show. We're going to be talking about interview tips for school-based uh, CFYs. So if you're looking to get into the schools and have some interviews coming up, you'll want to get tuned to that so that you can get some tips for your interviews. All right, thank you all so much for joining us today and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us today on The Speechy Show. We hope today's tips have helped you feel a little less stressed and a little more confident about your work. If you're looking for more stress busters and confidence boosters, we'd love to have you join us in The Speech Therapy Solution where you'll get access to a huge library of premium training videos and another library of print and go therapy materials. You can also get help with your tough cases by joining Carrie on the weekly Q&A calls or by posting in the exclusive Facebook group. Plus, group members can join us for a monthly webinar that can be used for continuing education credit. Head on over to speechandlanguagekids.com slash join to check out all the amazing benefits of the Speech Therapy Solution membership. Bye for now.